Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you see, uh, the spoke and then the lights came on. Yes. It's like church. It's like Jesus, just like Jesus. Sorry, I felt like I was doing a million things down there, and I was like scrambling running up here, but I don't know about you, I just got my communion element open, so I was, <laughs> I was a little late taking communion, so I hope you all enjoyed it. I did it by myself over there, because the, oh, the top layer, they weld it shut? I don't <laughs> What is going on there? I was like, I'm not going to be able to enjoy the bread. I can't. So anyways, welcome to Common Ground Church. We are glad that you're with us on this beautiful May Sunday, Cinco de Mayo. It's going to be tacos after service at any restaurant you decide to go to. Um, so we're excited that you're with us. If I haven't had the privilege of meeting you yet, my name is Matt. I'm the lead pastor here at CGC. As Amy was saying, we are a church that we firmly believe and try to set the tone that you're welcome here while you're working on it. Because like she said, and like I agree, we're all continuously working on it, uh, whatever it is. And so um, you're not going to leave perfect. Don't act like you're going to come in perfect. And everything will be wonderful. Um, but we're, we're glad that you're with us. Um, I do want to take a second. If you're new or new-ish, you can define new-ish for yourself. Um, we have these connect cards. And this is really just so we can get to know you. Uh, make sure you know that we know that you're here. Uh, if you want to slip in and slip out unseen, you, you can. Uh, I know it's, it, it's a smaller room, but you can still slip in and out unseen if you want to. If you want to be seen, though, we're probably going to see you. It's, I can see everybody. But we want to connect with you during the week. So we'd love for you to fill this out so we can connect with you. Just learn your first name, see where you're at um, in life. And uh, yeah, sound good? Yeah. Just fill it out. Um, we are in this series called How to Read Your Bible for All It's Worth. We are in week four. And again, the series is exactly as it sounds, How to Read Your Bible for All It's Worth. Have you guys been enjoying it so far? I've been curious. I was curious going into it. It's a little more, um, it's very academia driven because it is very much the nuts and bolts of how to approach reading your Bible um, versus just maybe you read it. I, I, I feel like for years and years when I first got saved, I read it and just tried to soak all of it up, and it was all emotional, but God is amazing through his word. He still speaks to you, and I've, I've also enjoyed reading it through study and learning the literature of it, the history of it, everything like that. So it's just, it's wonderful. So that's why we're in this series. I want to take a look at 2 Timothy um, verses 16 and 17. This is kind of the verse that has set the tone for each message. And it's important to go back to because we want to remember why we're spending so much time talking about how to read the Bible. It's crazy. Sometimes in church, we can just assume we all know how to read it and never actually talk about how do we go about reading it. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says it this way. All scripture, say all, all. is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. There is an importance and a value in continuously revisiting how to read the Bible, whether you're a new believer, a seasoned believer, or maybe whether you're just curious about faith in God in the first place. And what this scripture is telling us is that reading the Bible doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. Reading the Bible helps equip us in our journey of what it looks like and what it means to follow Jesus and, on, and the mission that he has for us here. So Jesus saves us. The Bible helps equip us. And at Common Ground Church, there's no banner that we raise higher than the banner of Jesus. In fact, our first core value, as we all know, is that we follow Jesus. So as we read the word, we do it through the lens of how can this help me follow Jesus? Um, so we have some basic goals that we want to put in the forefront of our mind each time we go. We want to learn that there's under, uh, understand that there's different genres in the Bible. We've talked about that each week. There's poetry, there's history, there's all kinds of different genres of the Bible. It's a good thing to know going into it. Second, we want to strive for an intelligent reading of Scripture, not just a mindless one. Um, you know, I, I'm not a believer. For a while there, it's kind of settled down a little bit. For a while there, it was people who believe in God aren't as intelligent who understand that there is no God. Uh, that just kind of blew my mind because science is continuously being proved wrong and reproved right. And it painted science and faith almost as opposition versus complementary. <laughs> uh, because I do believe that God created 
us created the universe, created the world, science is continuously proving how that actually was the case. Uh, and so we want to strive to engage our mind, not just our emotions, not just our soul, but our mind as well. Thirdly, understanding and obedience are the goal. Parents, you know this struggle with your kids. It's like they know what to do, but doing what they know to do is really the secret sauce. It's not just understanding what you need to do, it's obeying. And then finally, hermeneutics. We've been talking about that. How do we apply the Bible to our lives today? Is it relevant? Is every part of it relevant to our life today? What does it mean for us today? The Bible doesn't talk about vehicles. How can the Bible inform me on if I should follow the speed limit or not? Hermeneutics. We're talking about how it actually applies to our life. And so we started by talking about interpretation in week one. Then we moved to this fancy Bible study word called exegesis. Anybody, everybody remember what exegesis means, right? We're all here. <laughs> Understanding what it meant by the original authors to the original hearers. And then last week, we talk about hermeneutics, the aspect of hermeneutics. What does it mean for us today? So our focus today is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. It now, just a disclaimer before we get started. We're going to be talking about Bible translations today. Um, how many of you, you've been, whether to Barnes & Noble, maybe you go to Bibles Plus, maybe you just look on Amazon, the internet, and you're looking for different Bible translation, and you see there's about 437 of them. It's like, do these all say the same thing? How do I know which one I should pick? How do I know which one I should trust? All this kind of stuff. Now, disclaimer, this is not going to be an exhaustive message on the topic. This is going to be a good starter because you could talk endlessly on different Bible translations. But I think it's important. When I was a youth pastor, even as a pastor, one of the first questions when people first come to read their Bible is, which one do I pick? Which one do I read which one do I trust? So we're going to talk about that this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much for your word, that we have access to it today, that we can actually read it, that we can study it, that we can continuously pursue it throughout our lives. Um, Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would teach us all something this morning. Um, give us the understanding, give us the revelation that you have for us this morning, more about who you are, about what you have for us. Give us the mind give us the disposition, give us the focus to lean in, to listen to what you have for us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Can we give God some praise amen. for some Bible translations? How awesome is it that we have the Bible still after all these thousands of years to be able to read? Um, anybody ever seen one of the greatest movies ever made, Selena? Yeah. Anybody? I like it if you like it. I love Selena. I'm originally born and raised a little bit in El Paso, and then we moved up here, so Selena was always a part of the culture. And then the movie came out with Jennifer Lopez. I thought Jennifer Lopez was Selena for the long part of my childhood. <laughs> um, there's a scene in the movie Selena where her dad, if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, her dad realizes when she's young that she can sing. And she's got this, this beautiful voice. So he continuously tries to convince her to spend a lot of her time singing. She just wants to play. He wants her to sing. But then he also wants her to sing Spanish. And she doesn't speak Spanish. And so she has trouble wanting to sing Spanish. And there's a scene where they're running through the living room. And uh, Edward James almost that plays her dad. He brings her and he's like, hey, come over here. Come here. I want you to sing something. And he shows her in Spanish um, what he wants her to sing. And she's having trouble with it. And she's like, what, is, what does that even mean? And so then he says in English what he's trying to get her to sing in Spanish. And she's like, that's what it means? That sounds so weird. He's like, yeah, it, it's Spanish music, he says, sounds a little bit weird when you sing it in English. <laughs> and certain things certainly seem to have challenges translating across different languages, don't they? You can say it in one language and you try to translate it, but something Something almost inevitably gets lost, whether it's the emphasis, whether it's the, the cultural application. Other things simply get lost in translation. And when it comes to different Bible translations, I'm not sure if, I know the meaning sometimes can get lost. I think sometimes we can just get lost in it. But either way, it gives us plenty to think about when we're considering how to read the Bible for all it's worth. So I want to take a look at some of those things this morning. Again, this isn't going to be an exhaustive message on Bible translation. It's going to be a primer, if anything. And uh, again, this series is kind of loosely based off of this book, How to Read Your Bible for All It's Worth. Same name. 
Same title. Try to make it easy because I forget things. Uh, this is super, super helpful and a lot more exhaustive on a lot more of these topics. But I think it's important if we're going to hold true that the Bible is the word of God and it's true, we should probably learn why that is and, and learn how to read it and learn how to look at it. So I want to talk about, everybody got their pens? Because I'm, I'm about to go in nerd mode. So get your pens, lean in, and, and I'm excited. I hope you're excited because this is, this is fun. You having fun? You having, I know college students, you're like finishing up finals, but get ready. We're going back in the classroom today. Everybody else too. I want to talk about the science of translation. The science of translation when it comes to the Bible. Now, here's the three types um, of, of translating methods that I want to talk about this morning, starting with this idea called formal equivalency. Now, formal equivalency, and don't worry, I'm going to tie it all together, so just hang with me, trust in me, believe in me, because I believe in you. Amen? Formal equivalency. This is more of a literal word-to-word -word idea of translating scripture. Words in grammar, when they're translated into a different language, they try to stay as close to the original language, Hebrew and Greek, as possible. Now, in this way of translating the Bible, uh, understandable English is not really the goal of formal equivalency. A literal try word for word translation into English is more of the goal of this type of translation. There's a second type called functional equivalency. This is more of a dynamic one. It, it's still staying close to the original language, but it's putting their words and, and um, idioms into more how we would talk today. So he, what I mean by this is when you translate word for word from one language into the next, and then you read it in the language it was translated into, how many of you know sometimes those sentences make very little sense? in English, because we're like, I'm sorry. If, if you've ever used Google Translate, you know what I'm talking about. You try to translate it word for word versus the whole saying, and some things can get lost, but some things can become more clear as well. Everybody tracking with me? And then finally, there's free translation. This is more focusing on the translating of ideas. What is the sentence? What is the paragraph? What is it all saying let me summarize it. Sometimes it's called a paraphrase. Let me try to say the idea that the original language is trying to say and translate that here. It, it eliminates a lot of historical distance while still doing its best to maintain the original intent. So you see there's kind of this flow going. There's formal. Okay, what does the word the in that language mean in this language? Okay, what does the word tree mean in that language in this language? What does the word lamp Functional equivalency is a little more dynamic, and then free translation is more translating the idea. Everybody with me? Yeah. I could go deeper. That's good for now. I think it's good for now. Um, so the, the theory of these translations, these different translations, they have different theories behind them. Like, for instance, should lamp be translated, if, if it's translated into English lamp, should that be translated into flashlight? Or should it be translated into torch? for the appropriate culture that it's being translated for? Or should it be left as lamp and it be left up to the reader to fill in the space for their cultural region? These are questions to ask, but they're also questions that it's okay to wrestle with as we look across different English translations of the Bible. I have a chart. I made a chart. Here, so um, you might be having different translations run through your mind. I have three different translations here. These are the, the three Bibles that I typically use the most. This one, you can tell, I've had this for a while. This is the NIV, but they, they translated the NIV again in 2011. So this one was before that one. I got this in 2000. Uh, this is my NLT study Bible. This is usually my, my go-to. And then you can tell this one's my favorite. <laughs> Looks like it's barely opened, but it has my name on it. This is like my presentation Bible. This is one of my favorites. If I would ever pose for a photo, it'd be with this one. Um, because I like consulting different translation because if the Bible wasn't written in English, I don't want to like stake my flag into an English translation of something that wasn't originally written in that language to begin with. 
And so um, these are different translations of scripture and where they fall in those methods of translation. So the King James, New King James, more of a formal equivalency, more of a literal. And then you can kind of see the scale go over from formal to functional to free. Free. The message is, is a paraphrase of the Bible written by a guy named Eugene Peterson, who is a longtime pastor, great pastor, and he's a great pastor of pastors uh, for a lot of his life as well. So that's just to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about with some meat to it. If you were to read the New Living Translation right next to the New King James, you would see, something, like, wait a second, they say different words, what's happening here. But you can see why. It's not that one is more correct, more incorrect than others. It's just that they had different methods and theories behind translating for the language and culture that they were translating for. Everybody with me? All right. Because here, here's a challenge. Too formal of a translation, it, and it can go right over your head. There's certain meth, uh, verses in the King James Bible I read, and I'm like, what's that now? Is this a Shakespearean play? Because I don't speak that either. I don't know what it means. So too formal of a translation, it can go right over your head and, and seem out of touch with the cultural reality. But on the same is true of the other side. Too free of a translation, and it can change the meaning of the original text altogether. Sometimes you can read a, a passage in the message and be like, what on earth is said here? I don't understand. That's why it's important to know that there's different theories behind it. And therein lies the tension of translation, of different English translation, and the need for the work to learn the value of different translations, the purpose of those translations, so that we can extract the most out of it that we can. Amen? So what do you say we just do some real live work with it? You guys good with that? So I want to take a look at a scripture, 1 Corinthians 9, 22. Now, you might be familiar with this verse. This is the verse that kind of we use as our mission statement as a church. And I want to look at it from a few different translations. And even as you see it, you can see that there are some differences. When I'm weak with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. I try to find common ground with everyone. In the ESV and NIV, it says, I have become all things to all people. Instead of saying, I've tried to find the common ground. Finally, in the message, it says, I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant that there is. Now, just when you look at it, I tried to bold the section I want to focus in on. Just as you look at it, you can see that there are some reasons that could be problematic in different translations. Finding common ground with someone is one thing. Becoming all things to all people is seemingly another thing. And then finally, entering their world and trying to experience things from their point of view seems to be quite another. I mean, there's value in all of those, but again, if we take them out of context, and if we do what we've, we've all agreed not to do when we come to Scripture, if we come looking for backup instead of truth... If we come just looking to embolden our perspective and what we already want to be true, verses like this across different translations could just lead us in all kinds of different directions. I've become all things to all people. It can become a little problematic if taken out of context. It's like, I don't know, I was just helping murder so I could reach these murderers. <laughs> I was just becoming all things to all people to help murder I don't know, I was just gossip praying like everyone else does in the prayer circle to make sure such and such gets prayed for and covered in, in prayer. And, and it, becomes, it becomes, oh, I can really step into and do whatever I want so long as I'm trying to reach people. Again, that can become very problematic. On the surface, it could be misconstrued as a green light to continuously sin in order to help save people. But we've got to do the work to see what's really behind what is really being said. So what better way than using the verse that we have that helps us define our mission? Because the truth is, depending on the context of the real life situation, we may refer to one of these translations over the other to help get the point across that we're trying to match the realistic and the real time context of what's going on. 
For instance, some, something that you don't have in common with anyone. The idea is you probably have at least one thing in common. Let's focus on that. Let's get to that. Something I used to tell our leaders in youth ministry was more of like coming from the message. I said, if you get into their element, them meaning the students, you go into their world, you'll have a much more better chance of an open door at honest conversation if you willingly enter into their element versus force them to try to come into your element. If you ex try to experience things from their point of view. Uh, and so there's value in all of them, but there is some important work we need to do. There's three important things, I think, that will really help when it comes to looking at scriptures, especially like that. Number one, we got to find the context. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Well, we already talked about that. I thought we were talking about translations. Right. Context is king. Context, we always have to look for the context, especially when we're looking at different translations of the same verse. Now, I'm a big Fast and Furious fan. Anybody, anybody else seen the light DJ has? Thank you. Here we go. Now, I know what they are. You know what I mean? They're not Academy Award winners. We know what we go into those films for. They entertain me. That's pretty much all I'm looking for. Now, knowing that is one thing, but it does not prevent you from getting sucked into the storyline by movie 19. Like, and you're all of a sudden looking at your family like, it's about family to everybody. Now, my wife, she came out of the room, she was reading, and she came out of the room when I was watching a Fast and Furious movie in the living room, and she walked by, and what was on the screen, I could tell, shocked her a little bit, because she was like... Is that Ludacris and Tyrese driving a car in space? <laughs> and my response was, you can't say that. You don't know what's happening. You can't just come out and think it's crazy. You've not watched the other seven movies leading up to Ludacris and Tyrese, who very much needed to drive that car in space to bump the satellite off course to save family. <laughs> it's all about context. <laughs> you can't just jump in the middle and make up your mind about everything, only seeing it from the middle. Now, fortunate for her, it was as ridiculous as it sounds. Don't <laughs> so it's an imperfect illustration. <laughs> but the point I'm making here is that searching for and finding the context is so important to have a chance at an accurate interpretation of what you're reading, especially when reading the Bible. Not only will you find truth, you'll actually enjoy reading it more when you find out what it is actually meaning and intended to mean. So how do you find the context? You start with reading the verses around the verse. Don't just read one verse, plant your flag in it and saying, this is everything. Read the verses around the verse. Read the whole chapter. Maybe read the chapters around the chapter. In other words, you may not find everything in one sitting. You may need to revisit it. Spend some time with it. Because when we read the scripture around the verse that we just read about common ground, all things to all people, the verse before that, verse 21, Paul talks about being outside the law of God, meaning he's not beholden to the stringent demands of the Old Testament law, but being under and remaining under the law of Christ. So as he finds common ground, as he becomes all things to all people, as he seeks to enter the world and experience from their point of view, he does so while remaining under the law of Christ. Yeah. Now, it would be important for us to look into what the law of Christ is. Because we see that it's not the law uh, talking about reference in the Old Testament, the stringent demands of in order to be saved, you must do these, or in order to be right with God, you must do these things especially the law that the Pharisees of Jesus' day took that law, said, well, we think it probably means this, and made it even more impossible, like you shall never work on the Sabbath, even if someone's dying of hunger. You better not work on the Sabbath, because that is... And so it's important to understand what did Paul mean when he said, I remain under the law of Christ. And there's a lot of looking into that that could go into, but you could start with the life and ministry of Jesus, even when Jesus is asked, what are the most important two commands 
What is the most important one? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's a pretty good place to start in terms of figuring out what the law of Christ is. But then when we bring it here into this verse in 1 Corinthians, understanding that as we try to find common ground, as we seek to be all things to all people, we do so while remaining under the law of Christ. Amen? Amen. And it's not just talking when we're trying to do that with unbelievers. It's also talking about those in the family of faith. Paul was talking to the Corinthians, funny enough, in 1 Corinthians, also, spoiler, 2 Corinthians. <laughs> so when he's talking to them, he's talking to them as they seek to spread the gospel. He's also talking about them, about getting along and relating to one another as existing believers. Meaning to them, he wasn't stuck on an arrogant or entitled Christian mindset, but willing to focus even when he says, to the weak, I became weak. He, he wasn't focused on, oh, I'm so past that stage of being a Christian. He said, no, actually, I, I probably would do me some good and definitely us some good in me entering into their point of view in order that we all might spread the gospel and to help younger, immature believers mature. Everybody tracking with me? Yeah. Got to find the context. Another important thing that will help is we got to find the point. Great, we got the context, but what is the point? What is the heart of the matter? Verse 23 the verse after the verse we focused on, again, read the, verse around, read the verses around the verse. Verse 23 talks about doing everything he can in order that some might be saved, in order to spread the good news. It's all for the sake of the gospel. It is all, say all. all. Everything he's talking about, everything he's doing is all for the sake of the gospel. It's not for the sake of of me looking for loopholes to see what I can get away with while being a Christian. This includes what we've decided and defined to be outright sin, and this includes and defines what we've deemed in the church to be socially acceptable sin. All of it, everything that Paul is talking about, he's talking about doing it for the sake of the gospel. I think that, that means a balance between not overreacting and not underreacting when other people sin. Because here's the thing, there, there's sometimes we will look at a sin and be like, oh, no, it's okay, hey, we all do it. And then we'll look at another sin and be like, oh, my Lord, you need help. Now, you've, maybe you've heard the saying that sin is sin to God. Anybody? Yeah. It, it's true. Like Christ died for all of our sin and sin to him is sin. However, sin for us does have different earthly ramifications. It has different earthly consequences. So what we're not saying is those don't matter. What I'm saying is us as the church, especially as we're seeking to spread the gospel and live in peace as a spiritual family, is we have to take into consideration what is it all for? It's for the sake of the gospel. I would imagine that even if we broke into little small circles right now and talked about, okay, what's sin to you, we would probably have different comments. Or maybe not what is sin, what sin are you okay with? <laughs> maybe that's more the conversation that we could have. Because there's certain sin, if I'm honest, I'm good with. And there's probably certain sin that you're more good with than others. And so it's not about dialing in so much to make sure we all agree on everything that we ever talk about. It's about doing so for the sake of the gospel. And honestly, I could go on and on about that topic. I mean, I could explain every natural phenomenon. <laughs> the tide, the grass, the ground. Oh, that was Maui just messing around. Stop it. In other words... If you finding common ground or becoming all things to all people is more about anything other than for the sake of the gospel, it will probably lead you down a bad road. It can't be for the sake of my truth, and it can't be for the sake of my church. It has to be for the sake of spreading the gospel. Amen? Amen. Got to find the point. Got to find the context, find the point. And then finally, like we've talked about today, we have to consult other translations. 
When we're trying to figure out what the Bible is saying to us, we got to consult other translations because those will actually help in the first two steps in finding the context and in finding the point. It will also help add some breadth and some clarity to what is actually being said. I have become all things to all people. What exactly does that mean? Trying to find common ground with everyone. How do I do that? Enter their world and try to see things from their point of view. What does that even look like? And these three or four different translations, they actually complement one another and they help add some depth to it and they help clarify what we're talking about last week, the application in our lives with one another. So you may not know it, but we started our soap already. Our, we already started with our scripture. How, how does that, how does the work we've done help inform the observation, the application of this text? The observation, you know, when you look at that scripture, it sure seems like Paul has found some success in his attempts at sharing the gospel with people by relating to them and meeting them wherever they're at in their life, while at the same time remaining under the lordship of Jesus. That is a very easy sentence to say. That is a very hard sentence to live. How do I meet people where they're at while remaining under the lordship of Christ for the sake of spreading the gospel? We could say it here, we could say amen, we could say I'm going to do it, but then when the rubber meets the road, there, there, there's seemingly these moments where you're like, is this crossing a line? I can't tell. Am I thinking too much about crossing a line and am I becoming weird now? Um, am, I can't, I can't, oh no, that movie is, I can't, I can't go to the theater because I can't be around, I can't, oh no. I can't. And, and so we, we kind of get in our heads a little bit much because I think we sometimes lose sight of the point. What is the point? Spreading the good news of the gospel. So sharing the gospel with people is not very effective when it's transactional, but it sure seems to be effective when it's relational. We're not looking, I mean, I don't think Jesus said, go into all the world and make converts. Go into all the world and, and make sure everybody believes that God exists. It said, go therefore and make the disciples. Discipleship is very personal. Discipleship is very relational. It is not transactional. That's why there is value in the sermon, but unless you're, you're living it out in the context of community, your only source of discipleship is going to be Sunday morning, and it's not going to last very long. Something else is going to come in. The weeds of the week are going to come in and choke out the seed that was planted because discipleship is a personal journey. And sharing the gospel, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, seems to be a lot more effective when it's relational versus when it's transactional. So what do we do with that? How do we apply that to our lives? You know, it's seemingly pretty simple. Love people, build bridges, not barriers, not for, don't build reasons why people can't be a part of the church build bridges to help people realize how they can be a part of the church. And we got to do so under the lordship of Jesus. I think sometimes we fear like getting sin on us, like it's, like, like it's secondhand smoke. You know what I mean? Like, and, and here's the thing. Don't overly define what I'm trying to say either. <laughs> well, I mean, you could, but whatever. I think sometimes we're so afraid of the world getting on us that we forget that we're still in it. We're, we're not called to live in a compound of Christians. We're called to go reach people. While at the same time, knowing that a lot of that strength and ability is going to come from doing life with other believers. It's called spiritual family and community. But eventually, we got to go out there. We can't be so afraid of, oh, is it on me? I feel like it's on me. I got it. Is it? <laughs> It's like when you see a spider in a room and you kill it, but 30 minutes later, you're like, is it, is it, it's here, it isn't it, it's in my shirt, I can feel it in my shirt. We can't be so afraid of getting the world on us that we seclude ourselves from the world when everything we do should be loving people, building bridges for what? For the sake of the gospel. Learn how to like want something for someone more than you want something from someone. Like it's not about, hey, Got another person to say the sinner's prayer. I was out evangelizing. I was, I was talking to people. I, was, I, had this, I had coffee with this friend who had been coughing. Finally, get their life to Jesus. 
point, notch in the belt. Now, it's fine to celebrate, but remember, the whole point of it is for them, not for you. Like, oh, how many people have you led to Jesus? I don't know. Maybe don't keep score (laughs) or don't keep count. Uh, Because remember, people have got to know and feel that too. They can't just hear it from you. They've got to feel it from you, that you want more for them than you want from them. So you can see the value in consulting multiple translations as we study and learn how to read the Bible for all it's worth. It, It creates tension, but it creates a good tension. Not all tension is bad. This is a tension that will lead to a better understanding and clarity of the scriptures, which will help to lead to better application of the scriptures. And so the last thing I want to go over regarding some Bible translations, Adrian, you can go ahead and come on up here. And I want to fly over these because I want to get back to the point. But there are some potential problem areas to note as we look at different Bible translations. Now, there's a lot of words up there. But again, just bringing... Remember, the first two weeks, we talked a lot about maybe the most important factor to bring when learning how to read the Bible. Did anybody remember what it was? It's okay if you don't. It's a test. It was a long time ago. I've said a lot of words since then. Common sense. We have to bring common sense to reading Scripture, especially when we're talking about different translations because different languages have different words for things. It's crazy. I know it's brand new information for me this week. And so there's also different cultural impacts to using one word. I have a close friends of ours from Wales. There's certain words we say in English here that if we were to say that same word in English in the UK, people would be appalled. Like, did you just offend my entire family with one word? It's like, well, no, I was just saying the first name of somebody. I didn't, know, I didn't know that was lost in translation. And so a lot of these things like weights, measures, and money, the, the, the language that you find in the original language, and even the measurements for weights, measures, and money are all different. I, I don't, you know, dollars isn't used a lot in scripture. <laughs> Cheddar isn't used a lot in scripture. C notes I have never seen in scripture. Measures, like there's cubits, and then there's shekels, and then there's feet, and there's, there's all kinds of different terms for that. It's something to be aware of, because sometimes it can be a stumbling block. There's euphemisms, right? Different euphemisms are used in the original language that don't translate or translate differently, even across English translation, translations. There's Euphemism like, oh, to marry someone versus to lay with someone versus sexual intercourse with someone. There's all these different euphemisms that when we hear it in our cultural context, to, let, to marry and to lay with seem to mean different things. Maybe they can be involved with one another, but we have to understand that different euphemisms translate differently. So we should consult different translations. Vocabulary, we talked about that a little Sometimes my favorite vocabulary is flesh, sinful nature, and human nature. If the word flesh was used across the board for all of them, sometimes we can take that into our own cultural context. Word plays, there's different word play. There's different grammar and syntax, meaning how sentences are structured, how words are placed together. And then finally, there's matter of, matters of gender. A lot to go into now in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, but specifically in, in like 2 Timothy and Matthew, there's verses that use the word people in some translations and other translations that use the word man, that the man of God may be built up. Now, I think when we look at a scripture and think that the man of God may be built up, we can probably all come to an understanding that that probably means people, that the person of God may be built up. Yet elsewhere, when we get into matters of gender, we seem to be a lot more, it's like every time, the danger is every time we see man in the Bible, we translate it to male. Instead of looking across other translations, finding the context, finding the point to see when it's appropriate, does it mean male? Does it mean humanity? Man or mankind? It's important to do here. Now, when choosing a translation, there's just a few things as we land the plane I want to encourage you to consider. Number one is this, everything we talked about today. 
consider what we've been talking about this morning. Number two is do your own research and study on what went into different translations because you might learn a lot. How long was that, has that translation been around? What was involved in the translation process? Was it translation by committee? Was it translation by a single individual? Ask all these questions and wrestle with them. Number three, and this, I wanna make sure this comes through. If you're new to this, don't let this overwhelm you. It's a lifelong journey, learning how to read and study the Bible. And I believe God is good through all of it. God is still good and he places you in spiritual family. Ask, if you need to start, ask someone you trust, what's a good translation to start with? And that's a great place to start reading and studying your Bible. And personally, here's my two biggest considerations that I've learned and as I have conversation with people when they're considering which Bible to get. Number one is this, when you're starting out, a translation that makes sense when you read it is a pretty good start. Like don't give yourself the mountain to climb by saying, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna learn Greek and I'm gonna start reading the Bible. Start with one that makes sense to you and you can understand it when you read it. The, the language it's, it's using at least, maybe all the ideas and concepts you'll learn as you stretch across translations, but it's okay to start one, start with one that's easy to read for you. And secondly, whichever translation you go with, don't, here you go. Don't fall into the Apple and Android mindset. You know what I'm talking about, all you cult followers, some Apple cult members, some Android cult members, like it's one way or the highway. <laughs> Don't fall into that with the different Bible translations. Like, nope, this is the translation I started with. This is the only trans totally true translation of scripture as if King James had the authoritative voice on which translation we ought to read. Challenge yourself and always compare and consider other translation alongside your preferred translation. But most importantly, most importantly, let's remember what all this is about. Loving God and loving people. In other words, it's about the gospel. It is about receiving the gospel. It is about spreading the gospel. As Paul said in the verse we looked at in four different translation, I do this all for the sake of spreading the good news and sharing in its blessings. Would you bow your heads as we pray? God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that your word is, again, accessible to us today in so many different languages that we even have the privilege to study it at the level that we're talking about today. God, let that lead to a compassion and an empathy in us. Let that lead to a desire in us to want to know you more, know your word more. Lord, I pray that there was maybe just one single step that we all were encouraged in today in terms of reading our Bible but to put a bow on all of it, to, to put the overarching theme on all of it. God, we simply wanna love you and we wanna love people. Help us to do that. If, if maybe there's some of us in here who have never, never received the good news of the gospel ourselves, I pray that this morning would be that moment where Holy Spirit, you were doing something in someone's heart and someone's mind this morning, showing them for the first time or reminding them of your great love for them and that you have a plan and a purpose for their life. Maybe, maybe it was simply a, a reigniting this morning, a, a passion again to go to your word with new tools to do more extensive work in it. Whatever it was, Holy Spirit, whatever you were wanting to teach each of us individually this morning, I pray that that is what we would leave with this morning. God, we love you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.